came to the jungle with one express goal in, in mind, and that is to immerse ourselves in the jungle and the river and their culture and learn what it is they're fighting for. In the jungle, it seems like everything's evolving. No matter what plan you make when you wake up in the morning, everything's gonna go in a completely different direction. That's a big one. When I heard about this scarification ritual, it's the warrior rite of passage. You become a man when you catch one of these fish and get the scars. With our efforts together with the Kayapa, we could protect a big stretch of one of the most important tributaries of the Amazon River. In Vajrayana Buddhism, there is no heaven, jhana, or Valhalla. The faithful believe that paradise is all around you. The one path to get there is to change yourself. When I set off for Mongolia, I simply wanted to catch a big fish. But it's a place that changes you. It gets into your blood you achieve a higher state of being where you don't really matter. What matters is the people, the rivers, and the universe around you. You become enlightened. And when you get to that state of mind where catching a fish doesn't really matter, suddenly it happens. To get to the good fishing in Mongolia, you'll have to fly halfway across the globe, get to Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia, then take another three, four hour flight to the west side of the country. I've never traveled so far to get anywhere, let alone a place to fish in my life. You know, it's a challenge. You gotta drive, you know, four wheel drive and, and you know, God save the, you know. The, the roads are, are, are good and it hasn't been raining too much because it is, I mean, it's six plus hours of four-wheel driving to get to the river. Going 10 and 15 miles an hour through bogs, swamps, crossing creeks, crossing big grasslands with herds of yaks around you. We call it an expedition and it genuinely is an expedition. There's no two ways about it. Flights, four-wheel drives, there's almost a dozen camels and another 15 or 18 horses. Um, and, you know, the, the, the staff, the local Mongolians, we hire herdsmen from the upper river. Uh, and they're the ones that provide us with the horses and the camels. And, yeah, it's, it's an event. 20 to 30 people, um, you know, depending on which trip you're on, that, that kind of make all this, this possible. We went up over giant ridges and down into valleys and then back up and crossed over the river. Made camp, fished for a few hours. Oh! See that? And then spent the whole next day going up river again. And then boats, you know, we have, uh, we probably have the biggest fleet of boats in all of Mongolia. Um, <laughs> we have nearly 20 rafts, I think. Uh, inflatables anyway, between the drift boats and the, and the rafts too. So, um, yeah, it's cool. It's, um, it's a logistical nightmare <laughs> at the best of times, but it's, um, it's cool to see it all, all come together and, and work. The Mongolians are, they're awesome. They're super special people. They're lovely, they're, they're jovial. They're so happy to just sit and laugh with you and make jokes and they're, they're, yeah, they get pretty comfortable. I think it's probably a big part of Mongolian culture growing up in gares in these closed environments, but they'll come right up to you and put their arm around you even if they just, just met you, you know, a day before or a couple hours before and 
they're super fascinated by all these kind of gizmos and technology and stuff that we show up with, you know, drones and cameras and uh, fly rods. And it's, it's, I think it's as fascinating for them, you know, especially the guys on the upper river, as it is, is, is their, their culture and their, their lifestyle is to us. Um, so it's kind of cool to witness that um, exchange. Pretty amazing to see people not squabbling over little pieces of land. There's no telephone wires, there's no fences, there's no property boundaries. You know, they don't, they don't have all the tools that we have, but in a lot of ways they have much more than we have because they don't try to divide and conquer the land. Taimon are massive apex predators who have to hunt over a vast stretch of river to make their home. I mean, there, there's not 50 Taimon in a pool. There's, there's probably not 25 Taimon in a pool. These giant Taimon, they own a mile or two or three miles of river, and that's where they hunt. So it's hard to find them. If you find the right one in the right mood, they can be crazy aggressive, but you have to put in thousands and thousands and thousands of casts and many, many hours to try to find one. And then you find the right fish who's in the right mood and he's hunting. It's just gonna blow your doors off. It's the, it's the biggest trout you'll ever see in your life. Ah, Timon! Yeah, no, they'll, um, I think, Timon are, they're, they can be a fickle fish. I think no matter how long you fish for Timon, the, they'll leave you scratching your head. Yeah, I don't know, they'll, they'll, they'll make you crazy, all right. But that's part of, that's the beauty of it, too, right? They, 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 they'll drive you totally insane, and you gotta work hard for them, you know? You're, you're worn out, you're fishing big flies, heavy gear, um, it's exhausting, you're covering water, you're making more casts in a day of time in fishing than I think some anglers will do in, in a whole season back home. So we're floating back to camp for lunch, just chatting, talking, and I love how guides always have a sixth sense. Uh, he spotted a fish in a riffle, and he's like, there's a fish right there. And it's like, everybody got hush, tiptoed out of the boat real quiet. Then it became a matter of trying to find that fish that we had practically floated over. I was desperate to try anything. Mongolian River Outfitters and the Taiman Fund are working with researchers from the University of Nevada who are studying Taiman populations, movements, and genetics in the Delgar Moran and other Taiman rivers in Mongolia. Our goal with each mature Taiman is to attach a spaghetti tag, use GPS to record the exact location of the fish, and to get a fin clip for genetic analysis. So getting a Taiman into the net is just step number one. You have to hang on to the fish to record that data. He made a huge cast, and that belly caught in that fast water because he was hucking right over, right over the current, right over the main flow. Um, but he put it right in front of the timing, and as soon as that fly hit the water, there wasn't the, the timing didn't think twice about it. He picked up, he lifted, and he chased that thing down river. Yeah, yeah. And I think he went after it four or five times. He really did it roll, 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 roll. And it's just like, oh. And it, you know, that's hard. That's a challenge for the angler. You know, it takes everything not to, not to blow that, not to pull, pull that fly out of the equation. Oh, <laughs> And there was fish on. And that was, that was cool. That was, that was an awesome fish. And yeah, that's, that, those, are, those are the players we're looking for. What an eat! <laughs> oh, I thought I was going swimming on that one. Timon is a pretty gorgeous slab of trout. We've seen a lot of pictures. Uh, the picture never does it justice when you, when you see that big giant black eye looking at up at you. They're they're such an old creature that seems like there's a lot of wisdom there, and they do some pretty sly things. And uh, I think that fish 
came to net pretty early and uh, had a lot of reserve strength. Head first. There he goes. You called it. He's wrapped, huh? I could sense that that fish wanted to make a break for it. You know, you get a lot of fish in the net and they're spent, they're tired. They've got nothing left. There, there. Now, what a beautiful red tail. Yep, this is it. Yeah! Yes! Thank you. <laughs> Timon are powerful creatures, and they've always got something left, always got a trick up their sleeve. This is the fish I came all the way to Mongolia for. Uh, and I got a little bit greedy and held that fish up and didn't tend to the net like I was instructed to. Jeff said, whatever you do, keep that timing in the net. And that's exactly what I didn't do. <laughs> that was upsetting, I guess. You know, well, whatever. We got him, but um, you don't, yeah. I saw him walk away, but you know, in Ross's defense, he went, he went, <laughs> he went the, the, the extra mile and did a, did a good, a good dive after him and tried to get him. Um, yeah, that fish, that fish lives on, so. We got him, but he got us, too. <laughs> Mark Johnstad of Mongolia River Outfitters has always promoted the sustainability of this fishery. But the Timon Festival really took it to the next level. If you want people to protect the fishery, you have to first make them aware of it. And second, make them care about it. Pride of ownership, or at least pride in their involvement, is a powerful tool. And if it improves the quality of life for your children, that's even better. Letting the local people know that there is an incredibly important fish that's in their rivers that are still wild and clear, and you can drink out of the rivers, and it's an important thing that they need to preserve. And it's an important thing to build an economy around time and fishing. If there isn't an economy, around time and fishing, then the time and don't mean much to these people. And there could be, they could poach them out, bring a mine in here, do whatever. This is their river. This is their river valley. And if they don't care about the time and, the time and are not going to survive. What do you guys do to protect him? <laughs> We have communities that we we work, we travel through, we work with every week, you know, for the for the season, all year long actually. And um, it's it's as much about those communities, the people in those communities, and um, yeah, again, just um, empowering them and, and, and helping them protect their resource. Mark worked with Patagonia to get Tankara rods for the kids to use, and he organized a bunch of games, all of them centered around Timon and river conservation. He also invited his friend, Dr. Jeff Johnson from Bend, Oregon, to provide a Riverside Dental Clinic. And my friend, Dr. Grace Smith, a pediatric cardiologist from the Akron Children's Hospital, had always wanted to fish in Mongolia. The idea of a wellness clinic, I think, was a deal maker for her. I think half her luggage was medical equipment, ibuprofen, and sugar-free candy for the kids. Do is we're asking the kids how old they are to kind of get an age of or idea where they're at, and then um, figuring out what's hurting or not. Almost all these kids, probably 90 percent, 90 percent or more, um, are pretty significant. Cats. They saw 148 patients that day. I have to believe that those families are now more invested in time and conservation, but maybe that's a selfish way to even think about it. I think we all felt it was just the right thing to do. 
that was pretty, pretty cool to see um, the excitement behind all that. And Ross and myself, we got to take all the, we had, we had the easy job, we had the fun job to take all the kids out in the boats and uh, have a bit of a water fight with them. And it was just cool to see the whole community come together and, um, and, that, and that place and for a good cause. Could not in a million years do this without the Mongolians. Um, yeah, no way. We're, you know, at the end of the day, we're pretty much just volunteers here, and um, they they make it all happen. They really do. I mean, they're they're doing the heavy lifting. They're they're engaging the local communities. Um, yeah, they're we yeah we couldn't do it without them. Our goal is to make Taiman as important as they should be. Uh, and if we can help the local people realize how important Taiman are, they are gonna go out of their way to protect them. We're only here for a few weeks out of the year looking, looking for these fish. The, the locals who live in these valleys and gurs and herd their goats and yaks, they're the ones that are looking after the fish 365 days of the year. And we need them on our side. This, this whole fly fishing culture is very new in Mongolia. Fishing is very new in Mongolia. The, the guys, our guides um, in particular, they are more or less kind of first generation anglers, you know, uh, first generation ethical anglers. Some of them, their fathers were fishermen, and that's how they, how they gain their interest in the sport. Um, and that's actually how we got in touch with some of these guys. Um, you know, they would, um, they, they were on a list from some of the local angling clubs um, that some of the local uh, local angling clubs provided us with as people who would catch and, and actually kill time in. And we approached them and employed them and taught them their kind of catch and release ethics and, and the importance of the time in and the resource and um, just how special of a fish they are and how special these rivers are. And they've become, they have become the face of not only fly fishing, but conservation um, in Mongolia, which is super, super cool because um, it's a group of young guys. You know, these are guys that are my age, younger than me, little Tolga, he's, he's 21 years old. And um, <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of the leading faces in, in Mongolian fly fishing. When I was, yeah, when I was uh, like 15 years old, I used it to kill a time a lot and I need it. Um, but suddenly one day, the, my brother, the, they came to, to my homeland and then offered me to work for the company, which is named as uh, Mongolian River Outfitters. I, uh, as soon as I started uh, to work for this company, I started to understand a lot of the things, for example, you know, loving nature. So I think, yeah, this company really helped me to start to not to kill fish, you know, and, and, and really, really love the fly fishing. Tolga is a student of everything. It's not just the sport of fly fishing. I mean, that kid is good at everything that he does. Um, he quickly learned fly fishing, and he's adapted, and he's excelled, and I think probably with, um, like most things that he does, he's, he's probably surpassed some of his teachers, you know? The kid can cast, he's fishy, he knows where the fish live, how to approach them. He, he is like a sponge, he absorbs it all and he absorbs it quickly. So under these riverbank rocks and everything, there's a lot of little mouse holes and stuff like that, but it's not a, like a field mouse that we're used to, that we, we've seen them and they're like big mice, but not quite a rat size. This is Tolga's gurgler pattern. It's uh, tied just like a giant gurgler with a purple chenille body, but it plows a lot of water. And uh, these taimen eat a lot of rodents, not just aquatic food, they eat a lot of rodents that are swimming in the water and they are not afraid to come to a surface fly. The challenge is casting those big flies you don't see many people out here fishing with size 22 dry flies. The, the bigger, the better, and uh, you know, big flies catch big fish. <gasps> Can you eat it? Yeah! Awesome! There comes a point when it's just so much work, so much fatigue so much clunkiness that you just don't think you can keep going on. I was just praying that he would get that, get that fish in the net as soon as possible to reduce my window of opportunity to, 
to screw that fish up. Nice! Woo! Yeah! Fantastic! Yeah. Nice! He did an awesome job. Uh, he, I've never seen anyone get after a fish like that. Uh, he went waist deep right off the bat and tried to do the deep scoop. I was like, you know, made me nervous. But it worked out. He was pulling some line. Now let's get the big one. So you want me to sing that song right now? Yeah. Like whole part? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> That song was one of my favorite parts of this whole trip. Yes. And I caught a timing today, so that's saying a lot. People think if they come out and they're gonna destroy fishing, destroy them, and that's it, good luck with it. This has always been difficult thing. I, I like being out here, it's just, <clears throat> I don't wanna feel like a bird in a cage, just stuck in an in a office, and stare at computers all day, end of the day, you go home and sleep and do that thing all over again. I was just born. It's like being out here is like you're doing everything. Every every day is different. It's gonna be the fish is gonna be on, then it's gonna be on. And that day will be all excitement, all smiles and everything. And it's not about the finance thing. I do it for the love of doing this. But you make what a couple of hundred thousands in make sitting in an office, but there's no happiness in that. I want to make that little bit of money out of it and be happy with it. I don't know if time and fishermen are really tough or just delusional. You wake up in a gur every morning, you're sharing a beautiful river valley with the happiest people on the planet. But there's a little voice in your head whispering, you're not going to catch a fish today. Day after fishless day, that little voice can drive you crazy. Arguing with yourself won't make it go away. You either have to catch a timing, or you can take a deep breath, look around, and become a part of the universe where it just doesn't matter. You decide just to keep casting, take a step, cast again, feel the water rushing around your legs and watch the clouds go by. So about the first 80 miles or the first nine days of the trip, we had really clear water, super clear, beautiful conditions, hot summer afternoons with hoppers falling in the water and trout eating them. And then we had 36 hours of pouring rain and the river turned into this. I wouldn't call it chocolate milk. I would call it barely fishable. 
probably six or eight inches of visibility. So we're going to switch tactics and fish the real slow, soft water along the edges and see if the timing have moved in there to feed. That's what Jack's telling me. I should strip it a lot slower, right, to give it time to sink. Give it time to sink or that, uh, if, if, if there's a fish in there, that fish is just automatically going to take it. Because there's, now they're like waiting on something to fall in or swim by. So they don't need, they don't need to like spend too much energy in this kind of water. It's more likely they're going to just sit still. I know you love timing and you love timing fishing, but sometimes they, they got to piss you off. Right? Oh, yeah, Make definitely. you angry. Tough, tough fishing. I know it's a tough fishing, but still, if you, you're taming fish, you're timing fish, you can handle that pressure, then the rest of the fish is easy. And you cast for it, you cast for it, the fish doesn't pop out, then uh, mentally it just pulls you down. Like a moment you will start thinking like, am I at the right spot? Or am I using the right fly for it? That's a little bit tricky. So today for strategy, I know you're an awesome New Zealand guide. You got you got the eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fish I caught a couple of days ago, you spotted it first, and it was a total eater. Yeah, was so awesome. I was thinking today, I don't cast till you spot a fish. Really? That's a bold <laughs> <laughs> approach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think we should take uh, the the traditional approach and, and cover this water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to see the look on his face. <laughs> Floating 120 miles down a river really helps you get to know a river on a really intimate level. Probably about halfway down, you could see a change, not just in the geology from like limestone and basalt to granite and you know dry grasslands, sort of a, like a high arid desert like you would find in western Montana or Wyoming. But it was a pretty, it was a special experience to see the entire river, you know, from the, the headwaters down down into the big flood plains out on the grasslands. So we're in northwestern uh, Mongolia, and this river that we're floating, um, we're floating you know, over 100 miles of river during this week. And it's a beautiful river. I think, I genuinely believe that this is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. You know, it, it, it varies um, dramatically from where we started when we went up on the horses and camels at the headwaters of this stream to where we are now. When we got up into the top of the river, uh, it's an extremely restricted use zone in uh, what we would think of as a national park where there is very limited, there's no development and there's a lot of restrictions on what you can do up there. Uh, the herdsmen are allowed to graze up there, but it's a beautiful parkland that Hopefully we'll never see a road or a mine or any other kind of development. On the last day of our two week trip, the water finally turned from brown and muddy to a greenish color with 18 inches of visibility. After five fishless days, I was totally exhausted. The only way I could keep casting that 12 inch fly was with a two handed rod. I honestly had given up on catching a timon. I had lost hope. 
but I found something else. I felt like I had found paradise. I was a different person, someone who didn't need a time and to be happy. Of course, as soon as I reached that moment of enlightenment, uh, I cast the fly right up into the grass along the bank, and there's a tap and a boom. Oh, it's down there. Are there big rocks or? There shouldn't be a lot going on down here. I could see the fly land in the grass, and I could see it swim out from the grass, but then it kind of disappears in dark, murky water. But Jeff, Jeff's on top of it. He's, he immediately just perks up and starts to back row. Uh, yeah, nice. What is that? That's a, a timing. Yeah. Yep. I'm good. on. I'm on. Yeah. Nice, Ross. Just mind your line. Holy. Yep. Jeff was trying to back up to get away from it, and I have the the craziest high like textbook. This is how you break your rod and a 50-pound fish on the line. Oh. Yep. You're doing good. When, if he's around the boat, just mind the oars. Yeah. Mind him coming under the boat. The best boat rod is a short rod, and I end up with a 14-foot rod and a timon trying to hide under the boat. It turned into a, a bit of a fire drill with that fish trying to bury itself. So it, it was pretty heart-stopping for a few minutes there when that fish was super close to the boat. I got too steep of a rod angle if you could back up upriver. Well, yeah. There we go. I'm actually was worried about the rod blowing. Yeah. That's good. That's great. All right, Ross, I'm going to drop the anchor, and I'm going to jump out, OK? So Jeff does an awesome job of backing away from that fish so there's not a crazy angle that snaps the rod. He backs it up, drops the anchor in the weeds, and then bails out while I'm trying to manage this fish in like a deep slot right along the bank. That's a great angle now. Great, great angle. Yeah! Oh, oh, oh. Help! Help! Oh, oh. Going to shore. Going to shore. Going to shore. Woo! Oh, 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 yeah! Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. I've never seen a guide yell, help me before when he's wrestling a fish in the shallows like that. But it was a heart stopper. I'm just holding my breath, waiting for him to get that fish in the net. And even after it was in the net, it was still questionable whether he would stay in the net. Holy smokes. Oh my God. Dude. I can't oh. believe it. Yes. What I tell you? Oh my God. What the f Oh, oh dude. Oh. Oh, I love you like a brother. <laughs> oh my God. I can't believe it. I can't believe it happened. Okay, Nate, I almost lost this fish so many times. That's a monster. You're Ross. God, that's like a 40 pound fish. Dude, he's a pig. He came back for it. Okay, we pull some line off your reel. Okay. It's the biggest he net I've ever to... seen, and it's almost can't handle it. And I mean, that, that, that to me, that's genuinely a lifetime fish. I mean, that, that is a special, special fish. And to, to, to be connected to that, that creature and to, to hold them, to see them, that's a special moment. <gasps> yeah. I can barely even lift it. No. It's just amazing. Lower your knee a little bit. Yeah, right there. Baby, look at the mouth on him. Look at the tail. Let him breathe. It's just a cavern. Okay, we need to get measurements on him. Ross, can we keep him out here? Let's get him unhooked, okay? One kick from that tail, and it's gone. just, there's no way to hold him. No, exactly, so just be careful. Okay, I got I'm holding him. You work up on the fly. Look at that. And he's got so much girth. He's so, so powerful. So fat. Okay. Easy, baby. Easy. Oh, gosh. oh 
Good job. Good. That's why we fish barbless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amazing. This is good. Tape measure? Yeah, I'm gonna grab it. I have to grab it. I don't have it on me until my later. Okay. Don't. Don't lose them, Ross. Okay. No, it isn't. I did grab it. It's right here. Because I knew we were gonna catch a fish today. <laughs> Son of a. Look at that tail. Dude, look at that. It's like a, like a mermaid tail. <laughs> Only rarer. Yep. Only rarer. So amazing. <laughs> All right, Ross. So I need your help here big time. So take that to the tip. That taimen was likely more than 50 years old. It hatched when Mongolia was still part of the Soviet Union. It didn't end up dead on a stringer, and it didn't have a tag in it. So it had never been seen by another human being. 54 inch time and did. Push it down. 55. 55. 55. Okay, I'm gonna take this uh, girth real quick. You know, the root of time and fishing, I think um, the technical aspect of it is, is, is pretty simple. Um, but you just, you have to have faith, and that's what that's what I'm thinking about with every cast, even if we if, if it's been a day or two days or whatever, how long since we've even moved or seen a fish. You gotta keep your head in it, and you gotta think it's gonna happen on every cast, and, and, and that's probably the most challenging part about the whole thing, too. As fishermen, as anglers, as guides, that's what we do, is we try to we try to pick apart the puzzle, we try to figure them out, you know, and there's a problem, and if you're not moving a fish, like, you gotta figure it out, but really, you just gotta, you gotta kinda stick with stick with it, stick with what you're doing and, and keep covering water and, and have faith that on that next fish you're gonna find that player and you're gonna put your fly in front of him and he's gonna eat it. I just can't believe it. It's like, bam, I think I got a strike. But you don't know in this kind of off-color murky water, it could have been just a current and a rock or whatever. And Jeff put in the effort to row back up after it's just Holy just made the last two weeks of my life all worthwhile, that's for sure. It was a miracle, and I, I wouldn't have kept going if it wasn't for Jeff just saying that was my best shot. Clip of that giant tail. Our goal, the most important thing we could do as Timon anglers, was to carefully identify this fish for researchers working with the Timon Fund and the University of Nevada. A tiny fin clip doesn't hurt the fish. It's the least invasive way to take a sample of fish DNA. It doesn't just help identify that particular fish. Down the road, it helps answer questions like, are there different subspecies or distinctive populations of Timon? How closely related are they to other Salmonids? How far do they migrate? How fast do they grow? Maybe part of the magic is that there's so much we don't know about Timon. Using a fly rod to fill in those gaps seems sort of impossible, but poetic. He's in the net. <laughs> we did it. We did it. Yeah, feeling good, man. That's, you know, that's that's what that's what we come here for. You know, that's what we travel all this way for. Feeling. Yeah, we got him. Um, we, yeah, we did it. We did what we came here to do. All right. How you want to do this, Ross? I'll let you do the pleasures, man. I got your net. You could go up by. You got the, you'll take the net away? Yep, I got the net. This water's gonna clear a little bit. I just mucked it up. Beautiful fish, man. That's what you come to Mongolia for. 120 miles of floating camel rides, cold nights, pouring rain. None of that matters. None of it matters. He's all yours, man. He's ready. So much awesome. Dude, so much awesome. Well done, Ross. What a miracle.
The most important people are, are, are not the, the elders of the community, the leaders of the community. The most important people are the little kids. Uh, and I think we all realize that if you can make an impact on those little kids and help them remember the Timon fishermen, remember something about Timon, uh, that is, you know, that's going to pay dividends long term, and those are the those are the Mongolians that are going to change the attitudes in these valleys. What do you think? Good, right? Play it up. Whoa! <laughs> Just like getting off a horse. Yeah. <laughs>